Harvest, I just have to tell you, you are in for a treat today. Already, we have been blessed with amazing music, um, but I have the great pleasure to introduce to you uh, my very good friend, Morris Mathis. He is coming today. I know, so someone whooped, so you know him. You know, you, right. Yay, Morris, he's awesome. Uh, Morris has, man, y'all are like, yeah. they're excited. Oh, yeah, they're that, like... That smattering of applause. Should I just lower those expectations yeah. right now? Good. Right. Uh, so, no, Morris uh, has, has been uh, a pastor. He has been our district superintendent for ooh, what's our a area. District, what is a district superintendent? That, super? Doesn't that sound exciting? Like, God can call you to be a district superintendent. So, no, what that, what that means, Morris Mathis, is that he has uh, oversight over churches in the Central North District. What is the Central North District? What is that, Susan? That's that sounds exciting too, doesn't it, Morris? Uh, that is basic. How many churches? I don't even know how many. It's a lot. 50. Really? That's all? You get paid to spread? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'm a just, slacker. You know, it like, so there are apparently 50 churches in our North Houston area. And so he has been um, uh, blessed with the opportunity to have oversight over those churches and but he's, I just know him as Morris because he's my good friend and he is truly, he's a man of God. He has been a mentor and a blessing to me in my own journey of faith. And so it is a great, great pleasure that I have uh, that he would come and share the word of God with you today. So will you help me welcome him? Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Susan, and thanks for the, the privilege of being able to, to share worship with you. It's been a joy to be a part of, a uh, little bit of a part of uh, the Woodlands United Methodist Church as superintendent over these past six years, and so, um, and to work with Susan and know her and call her friend is a great blessing. It's a great blessing to be here with you. I'm glad uh, Mark uh, had the chance to go to the Holy Land, though I have bad news for you. If you thought Mark was manic before, Man, I'm telling you, when that dude gets back, you're going to be peeling him off the ceiling. I mean, uh, he's going to come back so fired up and so uh, enriched in his faith that, uh, yeah, it's going to be, well, it's going to be a little hard to deal with. So um, anyway, but it's, it's great to, to be here with you and just uh, worship with you and seek to bring a word. Let's pray. God, we do give you thanks for this day, for this time to be able to share and worship. We ask, oh God, I ask, oh God, that you would either speak through me or in spite of me, but whatever it takes, that you would speak to every heart in this room, whatever truth uh, they most need to hear this day. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, the scripture reading is uh, it's pretty, pretty quick, look fast, it's Exodus 20 verse uh, 16, and it's, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. Is there anybody in the room that doesn't understand why this is funny? Sure, we all get it. We all get it. Scams, ripoff attempts. It's just a part of our lives in this very interconnected world in which we live. Uh, I found a paper that asserted that on an average day, we hear, you ready? 200 lies per day. It further asserted that in this course of a 10-minute conversation, the average person will tell three lies. Believe that? I found it, you can believe it, because I found it in that bastion of truth, the internet, and so you know it's, it's you know, got to be true. Of course, what I know is that right now, somebody has pulled out their phone and they're Googling average number of lies a day. And you're doing that maybe because you want to know more, but maybe because you're looking at me going, yeah, dude, I don't think so. I don't know where you think you got that from, but I don't think so. I mean, it, it, it amazes me how, you know, like a lot of preachers, I'll get up and I'll, you know, preach and I tell stories out of my life and uh, my own experience just to try and connect and make it a little bit more real. And every now and then at the end of a service, 
somebody will come by and they'll say, um, they'll say, did that really happen? Is that, no, I was lying while I was pro- proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. So yes, let's just get that over with. But I understand why that question would get asked. Because the reality of it is that untruth is woven into the fabric of our life together. Uh, when they say, say the check is in the mail, most of the time the check is not in the mail. When they say one size fits all, uh, one size almost always uh, doesn't, doesn't fit all. Uh, when one person is breaking up with another and they say, it's not you, it's me, it's you. I mean, it just is. I mean, uh, you know, the notion of let's have lunch uh, generally carries with it the assumption that the last thing these two people are going to do together is have lunch. It's not, you know, it's just not, it's not going to happen. Uh, and when they say it's not the money, it's the principle of the thing, uh, let's all say it together. It's the money. I mean, it's just, it, it's, it's how it is. And, and the truth is, the telling of untruths, you know, it's, it's kind of part of the glue that holds the fabric of our society together. It just kind of is. Look, let's, let's do a thing here. Oh, lights, camera people, don't be shocked here, okay? So let's do a thing here. So uh, we haven't talked before. How you doing? Very well, sir. Okay, we did it. Good job. All right. Very well, sir. That's what we do. That's what we do. How you doing? Very well, sir. You seem like a great person, but probably if we sat down and talked, you'd be able to say, well, you know, I do have some stuff going on. This isn't the moment for that. This isn't the moment for that. This past Friday evening, I was getting some food to go at a restaurant and a very nice young lady on the other side of the register was, uh, you know, doing all the stuff. And she said, well, do you have a big weekend planned? And I paused a beat, and then I said, well, I'm going to a funeral tomorrow. And, um, and that was true, because tragically, one of the pastors in our district, uh, their 31-year-old son uh, passed away in his sleep a few nights ago. And so I was going to Dallas to, uh, to be there for the funeral. But as soon as I said that, I knew it was a mistake. Because she went, oh, well, I'm so sorry, and I, I shouldn't have asked that. And she, she got all flustered. I said, ma'am, it's okay. It's okay. You were, just, you were just asking. That was just more truth than she was ready for in the moment of, you know, exchanging, exchanging money. You'd like to think it's different in uh, the church, but it's really not. I mean, one of my favorite cartoons shows uh, these people who are uh, about to leave a church meeting. And uh, the person that's running the meeting says, uh, okay, so let's all go to the parking lot to say what we really think. Um, I, you know, the, the, the number of untruths that are spoken, even in, in a church setting, are legion, including, including my favorite, uh, good sermon preacher. And by all means, let that flow today, okay? You can go with that all that you want. It's just the telling of untruths. It's part of our lives. But we're no different. We're no different than, than other cultures. And I, I am certain that, that we are no different than the culture of, of God's people in this time when the Ten Commandments were given to them as a gift. It's against the backdrop of all of these untruths that are spoken among us that we have this word, that you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You not, don't give false testimony against, against your neighbor. Now, strictly speaking, this could be um, uh, applied just strictly in, in a legal setting. I mean, you know, back in those days when there was a legal dispute, the way it would work was that the elders would be there at the city gate and those that had the dispute would come to them and they would tell their stories and and then decisions would be made. A judgment would be rendered. And they were very serious about the truth. I mean, you read Deuteronomy 19, it kind of lays it all out. It says there's got to be at least two folks uh, two witnesses who tell the same story. 
in order for somebody to be found guilty. And if it turns out, Deuteronomy 19 goes on to say, if it turns out that it's discovered that one of those who gave testimony was lying, that whatever it was they wanted to have done to that other person, it will be done to them. They were very serious about the truth at those moments. We are too, aren't we? I mean, something makes its way into the courtroom. You're called on to testify. Man, I mean, you know, you raise your right hand. You know why it's the right hand? You know why we do that? I was reading about that because I got curious about it. There are a number of different explanations. The one I found kind of interesting is that when somebody was guilty of a crime, committed a crime, their right hand was given a mark of some kind that could not be removed. And so you're raising your right hand lets them know what, what your history is, what kind of person that you are. But you, you come to testify, you raise your right hand, do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you God. You ever done that? You ever been in that position? One time. One time I've been called upon to testify in a, in a, in a trial. And man, I'm telling you, when you, you've got the judge and the defendant, the plaintiff, you got the, they're all, and you rate, that's a moment, my friends. That's a, you know why? Because truth is sacred. Truth is powerful. And the speaking of truth or the not speaking of truth has huge consequences. It makes the difference between guilt and innocence, punishment and freedom. It could make the difference between death and life. Truth is sacred. Truth is powerful. And the speaking or not speaking of it has huge consequences. So though it immediately and obviously this commandment speaks to a, to a legal setting, it would be a mistake of us to think, well, you know, okay, that's good. I'll be sure and not lie when I'm on trial. We can't do that. The commentator uh, Adam Clark makes the, the assertion that really what this is about is not just what we do in a legal setting, but it's about our not slandering the good name of another, of another person. I mean, you're by telling untruths about them. You're making your way through the Ten Commandments. You're doing it Dave Letterman style. We're going from 10 to 1. Okay, you know, it's the harvest. It's kill. Cool. And so, um, <laughs> sorry. So, um, so, you know, so you start at 10. Let's do an overview of the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments is the answer to the question of how shall God's people live together? How, how shall they live as the people of the covenant? So the first four, one through four, the ones you haven't done yet, those deal with our relationship with God and, and how we shape that. The last six have to do with our relationships with one another. The last six are grounded on this common relationship, this common faith that the people of the covenant had with God. And so it, so it, starts, it, starts, with there, it starts with that. And what, what Clark asserts is that in the same way the third commandment says, be careful with God's name, don't take God's name in vain, in the same way we're called upon to do that, in this ninth commandment, it's saying you protect the name of other people as well. That not only do you respect God, but you treat with respect those who were created in God's image. So that it is a calling, it's an invitation to us to treat one another with respect and care. It's an invitation to us to live as people who are people of integrity. I, I, I was getting ready for this sermon and I, I stumbled upon a Facebook page that's called Lies Ruin Lives. It's called Lies Ruin Lives. And as you might expect, the, 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 the Facebook page is just story after story after story uh, that pe different people have submitted of ways that their lives had been ruined by lies. Sure happens. I got a, I got a friend, married to a great wife, fathered wonderful kids. He was accused 
of a crime that he did not commit. But the ways, and he was eventually exonerated, but what he went through on the way to being exonerated created so much devastation in his life. And I watched that happening and tried to be there for him and support him. But it was as frustrating and painful a thing as I've ever seen lies ruin lives. Maybe, I know, maybe I know. I know there's a number of you. Say, yep, yep, I know somebody. I got a friend, same thing happened. I know that. You know what also may be true? There may be people here in this room. You're going, yep, I know that story. I have lived that story. I know what that's like. And if you're here today, just the word of encouragement that I want to bring to you is to be strong in the Lord. Do not allow yourself to be defined by the consequences of these untruths that have been spoken about you and believe what Jesus said was correct, and that is that the truth really will set you free and that you can know beyond a shout of a doubt that if it's not true yet in your life, it will be ultimately, and that is that truth will win out over lies and that right will win out over wrong. Truth is sacred. Truth is powerful. And the speaking of untruths about other people in our day-to-day life can have devastating consequences. But what we know is, what I believe is, that for many of us, our issue is not so much the lies that we may speak about others that could be hurtful, but it's our, it's our ability to handle well the truths with which we live every day and that sometimes are difficult to talk about. That's why books like Courageous Conversations exist and other books like that that try and give us some, some guidance in, in, in how to speak the difficult truths that are a part of, of all our lives. It's what Jack Nicholson was talking about in A Few Good Men. You can't handle the truth. I mean, the irony of it is that that was spoken by a character who could not deal with the truth of his own actions and the consequences of his own actions, untruths not handled well and carefully in our lives can bring such difficult consequences. I was doing a funeral a number of years ago and uh, when you're a pastor, you, you get what they call the clergy record, which is similar to the obit, but sometimes it's not exactly the same to the obituary, but it's sometimes not exactly the same. So before the service, I was looking over the, the clergy record, and one of the things I really care about a lot is trying to get the names right and pronouncing them correctly, and, and so I was going over the names, and one of the children uh, of, of this gentleman, one of the children had a very unusual name. I didn't know how to say it, and so, so I went to the widow, it's like 20 minutes before the service, I went to the widow, and I said, I said, I really hate to bother you, but how do you say this name? Her face just went ashen white, and she stood up, and she took me by the arm, pulled me over to the side. She said, you must not read this name. And I said, okay. And she said, this is a child that none of our other children know about. And so, you know, I, of course, by, you know, I went with what she said, and we had the funeral, and all was well, but I found myself thinking later on, what if she had been named Sally? <laughs> what if I just stood up there and just, you know, survived by Bill, George, Jane, and Sally? Imagine that moment. And the kids would be sitting out there and they'd be looking at me and then they'd, Mom? I think about that family, and I, I don't know the story. I don't know the, the circumstances of it. I, I think about that, that woman, the life that she lived. I, I don't know the story. What I know is, though, that truth is complex. Truth is difficult. And it must, it must be handled with the greatest of care. Think, think of a knife. 
You put a knife in the hand of one person and they go onto a plane and they create havoc and horror and death and destruction. And you take that very same knife and you put it in the hand of a surgeon and with her skill and with her compassion, she brings uh, healing and hope and life and a a chance for a, a better day. It's the same knife. Truth is a knife. And it must be wielded with the greatest of care. Because it can be used to bring such pain and such destruction. Or it can bring hope and life and a chance for a better day. Some of the meanest people I've ever known are the people who just tell the truth. Well, I'm just telling the truth. I'm just telling the way it is. It's just the way it is. Really? Really? I'll watch couples and they're, you know, they're out with friends One spouse will say something about the other spouse. It's just embarrassing. One spouse is telling a story and suddenly the other spouse becomes a bastion of truth that everything must be exactly correct. And let me correct this and work this out for you. And I look, I look at the face of that spouse. Really? Did you, did you need to do that? Was it necessary in, in that particular moment? To speak that that word of truth. Truth is sacred. Truth is powerful. And truth can be used either to hurt and bring great pain. Or to heal and bring great hope. Paul's letter to the Ephesians talks about, uh, in the fourth chapter, talks about Uh, uh, spiritual immaturity and how we can be tossed back and forth by every doctrine that comes along. And and then in the the 15th verse, he starts talking about what spiritual maturity looks like. And instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the lead that is Christ. See, what Paul's communicating there is, I get it. The truth is dangerous if not handled well and carefully. But when truth is used with the right motives, for the, for the right reasons, spoken with maturity and care, man, truth can lift people up and help them to see themselves. Spiritual truths can be spoken into people's lives. They can change their hearts and change their lives. Do you know what it takes for us to be people of truth? What it takes of us is to staying close, staying close to Jesus. I think staying close to Jesus is a little bit like what happens um, to us when we get near a bright light. Because the the bright light will tend uh, to chase away the shadows. When we get close to Jesus, it tends to to reveal the falsehood that's in our own lives, the falsehood about our own selves, that that really we're we're not the truths about our own selves, that we're not really wanting to face up to and and figure out. We want to be people of the truth. We want to live in a way that communicates. We understand the sacredness and the power of truth. Then we need to stay close to Jesus. Lady Annabellum has this song that says, When lies become the truth, That's when I run to you. The world keeps spinning spinning faster into a new disaster. So I run to you. When it all starts coming undone, you're the only one that I run to. Obviously, that's talking about a person whose foundation of living is another person. What we're invited to do today is to run to Jesus and stay close to him. As he is the foundation of our life, Jesus is said on the way and the truth and the life. What do you mean by that? What was he talking about? I think what he was talking about is his own clarity in his own heart and mind of who he was set against the backdrop of all the lies and all the falsehood in this broken and hurting world. And that when we, when we run to him, we become 
more clear about who we're called to be and how it is we're called to live as followers of Jesus. Some time ago, somebody thought it was a good idea to say, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Anybody that would say that has never been on the receiving end of a campaign of lies and falsehoods. That's why this commandment matters. Because it, it points us to, it reminds us that we are to care for one another. Not tear each other up with lies or with truths. But live as people who protect each other and try and find ways not to tear each other down, but to lift each other up. It's ironic to me that this commandment, not to speak falsehood, is given in the context of commandments about murder and about adultery. What God understands is they're all bad. They all create brokenness. Don't be a part of it. Don't start it. Don't perpetuate it. Don't celebrate it. Make the commitment to say, you know, if I've been hurt by lies. I want to ask for God's grace to heal me. If I have told lies, if I have told untruths about others, I want to seek God's grace to forgive me. And if I've been somebody who has hurt others, because I was just so committed to speaking the truth, and I forgot to care for them, then to ask God to say, you know what? I want to do better than that. I want to fully reflect who Jesus calls us to be. We're people of the truth. The altar is open. You're invited to come forward and just bring whatever's on your heart, bring whatever's on your mind to God and let God do what it is that only God can do. Call to be people of the truth. The truth is sacred. It's powerful. Speaking it well and rightly can bring so much hope, so much life, so much healing. Just seek to be a person of the truth. Stay close, stay oh so close to the one who is himself, the way and the truth and the life. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.